Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us um, today. We're very pleased to see so many folks here. I know it's the end of the year crunch and the end of um, the quarter, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just have a couple of announcements, and then I'll introduce today's speaker. Um, as you know, we have a lecture series that's monthly. Um, the Workforce Lecture Series is intended to give um, updated information on evidence-based practices as well as information that's really usable for folks in the field currently and also for students as well. Um, so those upcoming lectures, this is December lecture, January lecture will be on safe care, um, so we're very excited about that. And then the February lecture will actually be evidence-based practice in primary care, so we're also equally excited about that lecture. I think it'll be some great information for everyone. Please come on in. Um, and all of our lectures are posted on our website and you can see the video of the lectures if you're not able to attend on our YouTube channel. That's um, youtube.com slash PBHJP, Public Behavior Health and Justice Policy. Um, so we have our channel there on YouTube and then we also have a blog with links to all the videos. Um, and you can comment after you've seen the videos on any thoughts that may have come up for you while watching the lecture or um, any pieces of information, citations that are related. So we really welcome uh, community participation in both of those forums. Um, please sign in um, a couple of housekeeping things. We're going to offer certificates of completion, but in order to get those for CEUs, you would need to sign in, <coughs> excuse me, sign in and then sign out. So I have the certificates and I'll be standing there at the end of the lecture. If you sign out, I'm happy to give you a certificate um, if you would like one. And then along with that, if you could please complete complete the evaluation form that's sitting there next to the PowerPoint handout. If you could complete those, it really helps us to know who was here and also how we can improve uh, moving forward. So I think that's it for housekeeping. With that, I'll introduce our speaker today. Georgiana Sedlar is an acting assistant professor and a clinical psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Sedlar's professional activities involve consultation and training, clinical work, teaching, and research focused on the implementation of and training in empirically based practices for children, especially those within the child welfare system. Currently, she is engaged in various projects to promote the successful dissemination and implementation of empirically based practices for children throughout the state of Washington. Her other professional activities include providing consultation services to foster care assessment program teams and assistance with the CBT Plus initiative. She will be teaching a TFCBT course this winter quarter 2013 and is excited to present the December Workforce Initiative Lecture. Prior to joining us here at um, University of Washington, Dr. Sedlar worked at the CARE Center at UC Davis Children's Hospital, where she developed and coordinated a trauma-focused trauma cognitive behavior therapy program and provided supervision, consultation, and training to various mental health providers. She also served as the co-training director for the center's APA-accredited pre-doctoral clinical psychology internship program. So please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Dr. Georgiana Sedlar. I think we could just all go home now, right, after that nice uh, introduction. <laughs> um, well, I am pleased to be here. Um, I, as Gabby said, just joined um, the faculty in late summer, so I'm um, see some, some familiar faces and some new faces, so um, really glad everybody showed up. I uh, guess it's a break from the cold weather out there. Um, did everybody, just really quick, I saw a few people come in. If for those who want a handout to go along with the PowerPoint, did everybody get one, or do we need to get some to you? Okay. Thank you. Brooks is there to make sure that this is being recorded. So today I'm going to uh, talk about um, evidence-based parenting programs and give you a little um, overview of you know, why evidence-based parenting um, is important and some overview, but then also um, hopefully whet your appetite maybe or just um, get you enthusiastic about the new uh, approaches that are being used um, to treat a 
how these approaches are being used to treat a variety of um, problems. So um, people who've developed parenting, initially it was for a very specific um, problem area, but they found that, um, lo and behold, parenting, um, its scope can, can reach much wider. So I'm going to give you just a few examples since we don't have um, a ton of time, um, but hopefully, um, like I said, we'll get you kind of um, interested in, in thinking. And I always welcome questions along the way, so um, I know this is a, a good size group, but um, certainly if you have a burning question, I would like it to be an interactive experience. So I, I feel like, you know, what better way to get started with um, parenting than um, a demonstration or a video clip of, let's see, whoops, of a naughty child. So what I'm going to show you um, is a uh, clip from a um, UK, it's a government um, program where it was a TV series called Driving Mum and Dad Crazy. Uh, <laughs> not mom, mum, because they're, they're in the, the UK. And um, this shows just a little snippet of Thomas, who was one of five um, families who they, um, they followed during this, this series. And I'll, I'll talk about it because it's, it's one of the, it was part of a intervention um, of Triple P, which is one of the treatments I'll be talking about today. So. I'm going to kill you. I would. I would. Sometimes we sort of feel that had we had Thomas first, we perhaps wouldn't have had another child because of his behaviour and the way he is. But, you know, thankfully we had Josie first and, and now we're just dealing with Tom. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Tom. Tom. Come on. Shut up. No. In Bolton Le Sands, another dad, Paul Hardy, has also just returned home from a hard day's work. Thomas! Paul is a greenkeeper at his local golf course, but the real graft begins at home. Now get, look, you're going to slip on there one day and you're going to really hurt yourself. Helping wife Yvonne try and cope with three-year-old Thomas. Stop being silly. Now come on. Stand up. There's a fair live way compared to a lot of other three-year-olds, you know. Stop being silly. You're hurting me. I'm not hurting you at all. He just seems to have a lot of energy. Very active. Wants to be doing everything and anything. No. Hello. Now why do you do that, Tom? It's not clever. It has decided to draw on the wall quite successfully. No. Where am I playing? It's naughty. You're not sensible with them, Tom. You're too naughty with them. Right, Tom. <laughs> Why did you do that? Shall we? We bought you a book, didn't we? We got you specifically a colouring book. The colouring the book, not the, the crayons. Shut up. That is just Thomas Dad. through and through. Just naughty little things like that. Not shut up. At you then. That's when you turn your back for a moment, you say. Because if he's not shouting above you, as he's doing now, because I'm talking to you. If he's not shouting above you, we're doing something to get your attention another way. I I I just don't think this is part of the deal. Yeah, and he's just just cleaning. And mum's cleaning on the go all night, every night. Mummy, shut up. I really don't like this sort of yob culture that's nowadays. You get children that don't respect their elders, you know. Go away! I'll come and get your tea. Goodbye. No, come on, come and get your tea. If it's not caught in the early, you know, his early years, then it could, it could, it could increase to, pro to the part where it becomes a, you know, sort of a lout. Right, Tom, come on, we'll go downstairs. Well, Tom, what? No, no, why do you do that, Tom? Shall we? Lately, Thomas's constant unruly behaviour has left the Hardys at breaking point. Can, just, can you go down with your brother, Joe, and just watch? She doesn't do anything else, please. 
Josie misses out on a lot of attention. She thinks that I don't love her. She's openly said to one of my friends that she doesn't like Thomas. Nick got funny then. Tom? <laughs> don't. No. Stop, stop it. Now. You don't. Stop. We've got to the point at times where myself and Yvonne have hit to put a, relation, a stress in our relationship. <laughs> to the point where Yvonne wanted to walk. I just had enough, basically. Just right up to here. And... I just got my coat on and I just I just wanted to go. Yeah, I'm not. Don't do that to mummy. I don't like you. Why? Why don't you like me? That's nice. What do you think? It's just I'm so unhappy at the moment with my life at home. I don't see anybody. I don't go to my friends because of the way Thomas is. This is my life, basically. You've been a good boy, Tommy, you know? Well done. All right, we'll stop it there. So, anything that stood out for you? Anything? Nothing? <laughs> Any comments? Yeah. You should turn off the, the TV for the next three years. <laughs> yeah, so um, it shows you how much um, kids learn through their environment and how much they imitate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that I would actually say, I mean, I think you've hit upon something Im really important is that there's consequences, but for what for what behaviors is he getting into attention for i mean he's negative right he's he's you know they're kind of up on the on the the table and saying shut up shut up and and um his dad is saying stop you know giving him lots of attention you know, even giving him physical closeness when he is doing um naughty things and what about um there wasn't a lot of um displays of you know positive behaviors but there was there was a couple um that that thomas displayed um that shows that he you know he's not a completely lost cause right did anyone notice i i noticed two things that were very very fleeting did anybody else sort of yeah right and it was also very much in the context of like all this other negative stuff that had happened before right that he was I think he had hit and then yeah but you're right so that so right right that that was the one that I noticed too and then also he just even though after he squirted out all the soap onto the to the carpet um, he he said sorry um, so it shows that he's not, you know, without, um, without promise. But what, one other question I have for you is, you know, the mom kind of really talked about this, the last little bit of that segment that, um, I mean, how do you think they feel about the relationship? I mean, what do you, what do you think that that is like on a day-to-day -day basis for them? Or how would you characterize that this parent-child relationship? Yeah. They talked specifically about him. Him, 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 and there was nothing about us and what we could do differently. Right. That it's that it was it's all him. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I mean, they they said basically, you know, if he had come first, we wouldn't have. That would have been it for us. And then I, the mom said at the end, you know, I've got my coat on. <laughs> like I, you know, I mean, her life is very limited. She does say she doesn't go out. I mean, she seemed kind of. Um, depressed. So, so definitely, um, they are in need of. Let's see if I can. Whoops. Maybe I need to go back. Oh, Zoom. So, um, you guys have have touched upon some really important points, and why um, we're talking about um, parenting is because we know that parenting um, influence on a kid's development, well-being, behaviors is very, very pervasive. 
And there were lots of um, things in, in that video clip that I don't think the parents, you know, woke up and said, oh, we, we want to be involved in, you know, the maintenance of these kids' behaviors. But the reality is, is that their parenting practices were affecting the kids' behavior, unfortunately, in negative ways. But the good news is, is that you can reshape parenting practices um, because they are so integral to so many aspects of a kid's um, well-being and development that you can reshape um, their practices to promote more positive behaviors. And what um, the, the, the focus of this talk is not just on, you know, hopefully you guys all appreciate and know um, the advantages to evidence-based parenting practices, but how the field is really recognizing that because how central the parent is um, to so many of these treatments, treatments for these problems on this slide, um, that they're recognizing um, the need to incorporate um, the parent in treating not just, you know, disruptive behaviors, not just naughty behaviors, which parent, parenting practices or evidence-based parenting has um, initially developed for, but the, but the scope is widening. And there's, again, we talked about, you know, the parent, there's some common common themes in um, evidence-based um, practices for parenting. And one of them we, you guys already sort of you know, talked about and we saw it from the, from the clip of Thomas is that the parent can really be an agent of change because they are such a powerful influence you know, on, on so many aspects of a child's life that um, they, instead of working with the child um, to change behaviors, that the parent is um, the parenting behaviors need to change, and by extension, the child's behaviors will change. And really, um, the sort of um, elements that are distilled down in evidence-based parenting is this focus on the relationship, on developing skills, and on changing what comes before and what comes after those behaviors. Um, and I think that, um, again, that clip was a good example of um, that, that parent-child relationship definitely could use some work. Um, the parents, you know, um, seemed like they were well, um, well-intentioned and wanted things to be differently, but needed some more skills, and and that they could set up the environment in a way that would promote more um, positive um, functioning and behaviors, and that a lot of the um, the theories that evidence-based parenting is drawn upon are very similar. So a lot of, you know, obviously behavioral therapy, behavioral principles, but also social learning, cognitive social learning theories, and um, what we know about uh, attachment and child development. Um, I think the good, thing, the, the good thing, too, is that you can promote a lot of change in children in a relatively short amount of time. So if, you know, Thomas's parents came to, um, to one of your offices or came to, for those of you who are clinicians, to treat um, for treatment, you know, you could instill a lot of hope that, that there could be a lot of change in a short amount of time. They may, it may take some convincing because they've been dealing with this probably for a while. But, and they, they are, um, evidence-based parenting programs are very structured, but I think there's often a misconception that it means that um, it's very rigid. And as we'll, we'll see in um, some examples that I'm going to illustrate, that actually um, there's some real innovative thinking around using um, the, some of the format of these parenting interventions in new, in new ways. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these treatments um, are, are developed. That's actually uh, the University of Washington cherry blossoms. I thought that was such a nice, nice picture. Um, but uh, we're fortunate to be um, at the at the U. Um, but the reality is, is that treatments that are developed in the university that it invites sometimes some skepticism or concern about whether or not. You know these treatments that were developed in universities can really can really work for the range of problems that um, are seen in in clinic settings, and um, this is just a, just to give you an idea of what what the literature is showing is that we really know um, that evidence based parenting programs can work and are effective and being used with a range of populations, with a range of settings, 
um, with a range of family demographics and difficulties. So, um, you know, different um, DSM-4 disorders, um, parents who are at risk of maltreatment or who have maltreated, um, finding really great um, effects with evidence-based parenting in terms of reducing, reducing risk, reducing recidivism. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think which which one of these um, treatments, and if anybody else knows, but I know they have there have been some um, studies looking at um, parenting interventions with fetal alcohol and and sort of developmental de delays more more generally. Thank you, Gabby. Gabby's my mic person. I think we have another que we have another question in the back or no? No. Okay. Um, so we are very lucky um, here in Washington State to um, not only have uh, you know one or two, but multiple top-notch evidence-based parenting programs available. And um, the four that I'm going to um, talk about today are the Incredible Years, um, or IY, Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, or PCIT, uh, Positive Parenting Program, or Triple P, and then um, Safe Care. I'm not going to give as much um, attention to safe care because my colleague Kimberly Shoecraft, this is a little promo for January, is going to be um, giving a workforce lecture on um, safe care. So um, I look forward to, to that. So we are very lucky and for those of you who may or may not be aware of um, recently passed legislation of House Bill 2536, um, which basically is um, trying to promote the use of evidence-based practices, not just parenting practices, but evidence-based um, practices for mental health, for child welfare, for juvenile justice. And so um, it's a, a really great time. I, I am impressed with Washington's um, um, innovation and progressive thinking in this. So I, again, we're, we're very lucky to have access to um, to these treatments. So for PCIT, um, and some of you, for those of you who already know, um, I apologize for the redundancy. If you have anything to offer, please please do. Um, PCIT is was developed for um, children between the ages of two and seven, but um, again, in terms of widening the scope, they have done some studies where um, they've done it with older um, kids up to 10, 11, and, and found some um, good results. But typically, initially, it was developed for ages 2 to 7. And really, again, it's you'll, this recurring theme is that these... Um, Treatments are for kids who have naughty behaviors. I, I like that not term naughty behaviors, but you know those disruptive behaviors, tantrums, aggression, um, oppositional defiance, um, and also um, where the relationship is um, pretty impaired, which often happens in families where the kid is acting out. Um, the you know starts this negative sort of coercive um, pattern of, of interactions where um, you know the kids not getting much um, positive and the parents not feeling very good about the relationship. Um, it again is meant to be um, relatively short term, as many of these, um, for the most part, are three to three to four months. It, but it can go longer depending on the needs of the of the family. And um, the, the sort of unique thing about PCIT is the way in which it's not so much the principles that are um, anything new. They're, they're just good, those good basic um, behavioral parenting principles. But it's um, used the way the skills are taught and the way the parents learn the skills is through a, a bug in the air where the um, typically in how it was originally developed was a one-way mirror. A therapist is behind a one-way mirror and is observing the parent and coaching them on a specific set of, of skills. So the nice thing is, is that it's in vivo and then it's immediate and then it's real time. They can get, they can get the feedback. And parents have to show certain um, progress through through treatment before they move on from uh, one phase to the other. And again, it's very, it's very structured. There is um, some didactic sessions, and then really where the bulk of the treatment is is in these coaching sessions. And the two phases, um, first, they uh, focus, the treatment focuses on building the relationship. So again, in the case of, of Thomas, um, I think they would get a lot of benefit from 
um, these uh, what is called pride skills and really what they are are um, helping parents to attend to their children's positive behaviors and um, ignore negative attention seeking behaviors not harmful behaviors but just negative kind of what we would call annoying frustrating um, behaviors and then once they learn those skills it's much easier to move into the discipline um, phase in which that's where parents learn how to use effective and safe discipline strategies and how to provide consequences for um, non-compliance. And I thought I would just show an example of, um, of the CDI skills being coached. This is a, um, for those of you who are interested in, in learning more about PCIT, there is a web-based um, training and it's on your, the, um, website is on your handout toward the end where it takes you through all the different um, components and, and aspects of uh, PCIT. Welcome to Module 6 of the PCIT web course, Coaching Relationship Enhancement or CDI. Let's take a look at several segments of coaching, paying attention to the rhythm between parent and child. Pay particular attention to when therapists followed, when they led, how much they talked. Oh, these were in my tummy. Great reflection, Judy. Good. The more you reflect, the more talkative Tana's getting. Oh, God. And I noticed since you started to play with her that she looks a lot more confident. She's also not doing that clingy behavior that she was doing at the beginning of the session. So that's really good to see that your reflections and also your descriptions are really helping her improve her behavior right now. I guess this one. No. She really likes all the attention that you're giving her right now. I see it. Here. Nice reflecting. There it is. Oh, what are we looking for? There's just a little little snippet of um, getting the use of um, positive attending skills to enhance the relationship. Yeah. So the, yeah, so the question was from Rima, an excellent question, is if you watch all the modules, does that make you a certified PCIT therapist? And no, it doesn't. It's a lot of these web-based um, training um, are a nice introduction and sort of get people oriented and understanding, but it doesn't um, mean that then you are certified and you can should go out. It, uh, the evidence-based parenting requires um, didactic training in addition to ongoing consultation and, and supervision. So good question, Rima. And then I thought I would just show, again, from the same one, um, just what the PDI, so that was CDI, and then this would be um, the, just an example of what parents learn in PDI. Welcome to Module 8 of the PCIT web course for traumatized children. In this module, you will learn about... Once parents understand how to give direct commands and timeouts, you will coach them to give their children easy to follow commands where the child is likely to comply. A way of creating easy commands is to help the parent watch what the child is doing, try to predict what the child will want to do next, and give the child the command to do what he or she was likely going to want to do anyway. For instance, if the child picks up the unopened medical kit, the parent can give the child the instruction, please take the doctor's tools out of the bag. Let's take a look at Dawn giving an easy to follow command. Kill, please continue to write happy birthday. Good job. And he's doing it. Yes. So this way, since he's doing it anyway, she'll be able to follow up with that nice label of praise for compliance. Thank you for listening, Caleb. Good job, Don. You're welcome. Any questions about that? 
So that gives you an idea of the, um, the structure and format of PCIT. And what I think is some exciting um, sort of expansion of the structure and format is they found that um, you can use the, the modality of PCIT, the, the live coaching, um, the bug in the ear, the, you heard the therapist you know, giving feedback and instructions to the parent in treating anxiety disorders. And um, initially, they um, just focused on, um, Pincus and her colleagues, just focused on using PCIT um, with separation anxiety. And so instead of um, doing the CDI and the PDI, they added in a phase in between that called BDI, or brave-directed interaction. And so the parents were coached to promote um, behaviors specific to um, being able to tolerate separating from, from their parents and using a lot of um, the same differential attention. So attending to what we call approach behaviors um, and ignoring anxiety, anxiety displays. And more recently, uh, Jonathan Comer out of um, Boston University is develop, has developed this uh, program called CALM and everything, as you know, has an acronym. So um, it stands for, uh, we'll see on the next slide, it's very long. Um, but basically, the CALM program took, built upon um, the Pincus's work and found that you can use this PCIT structure and format to treat a range of anxiety disorders. And you know what is it's such a nice, um, such a nice fit and such a great example of recognizing again how important parents are in the um, inadvertently, but in how important they are in the development and maintenance of anxiety disorders in children. And that um, what what we know is that there are great evidence-based practices for anxious children, but they tend to be for older kids. And so a lot of the things that those practices focus on in terms of skill building, and there's a lot of um, paying attention to kids' thoughts and having them change their thoughts. For younger kids, that's much harder to do because of their developmental and cognitive limitations. So this is a great way to treat um, early on kids who have um, anxiety disorders to prevent long, uh, you know, long-term negative um, outcomes. So it's coaching approach behavior and leading by modeling, so CALM. And like I said, it's just the PCIT concepts and the, um, the format of it, but it builds in because the, one of the main, main important things of treating kids with anxiety is you have to have exposure. So you need them to no longer avoid the things that make them anxious and then they develop mastery and they can see that they can um, tolerate uh, previously anxiety provoking situations and as I said this is really w geared um, well toward kids who are below the age of, of seven the the number of sessions is about the same and the CDI is still um, very is still similar to the traditional PCIT in which parents are taught um, you know, good relationship building skills. They're taught to praise, to reflect, uh, to describe their children's um, behaviors. But then specific to anxiety is the parents are provided with psychoeducation about um, how anxiety develops, about, um, you know, how they, how their child maybe um, developed anxiety and how it's maintained how your um, kids' you know, bodies respond when they're anxious, all those things that, that um, we would do in, in evidence-based practices for anxiety. And then also working with the parents on developing a fear hierarchy, which is a common, um, a common strategy or a common component of anxiety treatment, is making basically a list of what are, you know, talking with the parent about, okay, what are the things that your, that, you know, your, your kid can tolerate um, pretty well, and then moving up on the list to, you know, what's, what's the situation or scenario that causes, you know, the most extreme anxiety. And so it's basically making a rank ordering of these so um, that will inform future sessions in which the um, parent is um, coached to 
engage in these exposure tasks where starting out with the low level, um, sort of minimally anxiety provoking tasks and moving up on um, the list as the child masters um, the subsequent lower one. And then instead of, there's no PDI, um, which is the effective discipline, the you know, strategies for noncompliance, um, although it can be added if you had a child who was also displaying ODD, um, oppositional defiant disorder, or, or you know, in that class of behaviors. So um, that can be added, but in situations in which it's pretty much just primarily anxiety, the PDI phase is replaced by DADS, again, another acronym, <laughs> in which the parent, I'll show you here, so this is an example of um, a potential coaching session in which, let's say, the child's fear was um, of approaching a, a dog. And first, the parent would be instructed to just describe the situation and make three statements. So with the dog, they might say, it looks like a dog is coming our way, the dog has a red leash, and we've walked by dogs that look like this one before. The second step in this would be the approach. So here is, again, the, the, you know, that central part, that central role that parents play the parents are going to model for the child the behavior that they would like the child to display. In this case, it would be approaching the dog. So the parent might walk toward the dog and start petting um, the dog. And the third step would be then to give a direct command, which again is something that um, all good evidence-based parenting um, programs highlight and emphasize. So a direct command in that situation might be, please stand next to me while I pet the dog. And the last one, which is so important, is giving that selective attention or differential reinforcement or differential attention um, where you are going to, you want the parent to give labeled praise for the approach behavior and ignore um, behaviors that might go along with that but are um, like, in, associated with anxiety. So if the kid approaches the dog, let's say, but is you know, maybe doing whining or is kind of sniffling, the parent would want to just focus on the behavior of approaching the dog. So they might say, great job walking toward the dog and just ignore, not give any attention to um, the crying, the whining, that sort of thing. So the, the child is learning that they're going to get their parents' attention um, by engaging in these approach behaviors and they're not going to get reinforced um, for the anxious behaviors. Any questions about, about that? Okay. Yeah. So, um, in that model, you know, you're addressing Right. So in this treatment model, how much attention is spent to working around the anxiety? That's a great question. So the question, just to repeat it, is um, what if the parent also has high levels of anxiety? Um, how does the treatment sort of deal with that? Did I characterize that? Well, okay. <laughs> um, so it is, again, focused. It would be something important to point out in the psychoeducation about the relationship between their displays of anxiety and their child's displays of anxiety, but it's not meant to be a treatment to um, directly affect parents' anxiety. So I think as a, as a clinician, you would have to make the judgment if you needed to um, encourage the parent to seek out their own individual um, therapy for anxiety disorders. But sometimes I think what happens is, um, I think it would depend on when the anxiety began in the parent. Sometimes parents get anxious seeing their kids being anxious. I mean, I think that's, um, you know, normal and typical. And it's hard for them to see distress in their children. And so I think within that, you could definitely 
um, within a PCAT framework could coach the parent on trying to, um, to, to regulate themselves well enough to be able to encourage their, their children. So I, I think not to I mean, say it depends, but in a way it, it, it is a, a case by case basis. But that was a great question. Any others? Yeah. A growing comment or concern people have about behavioral approaches is that it ignores the child's emotions. And, um, and so the child's not developing maybe emotional competencies or awareness. And this example kind of highlights that. Do you have, what do you, what do you usually respond to when you hear that concern? Um, I, I think that, um, I mean, I have heard that concern as well, but I do think a lot of these parenting interventions, I think because people, because the word behavior is in there, they think that emotions are completely ignored. And I would, I would argue, and for those of you who do these practices, feel free to, to chime in if you um, would like to, but I think they do promote the um, encouragement of emotion awareness and helping kids to regulate their emotions and to be able to deal with that. Like, for example, just that little snippet that we saw in the, P the CDI coaching, where I don't know if you heard the, co the therapist saying, oh, um, she's not doing as much as, you know, you're giving her, um, you're helping her to be confident and she's not as clingy as she was. So I think that, that um, and there is research to show that um, a lot of these parenting interventions promote social competence in children, promote emotional competence, help with emotion awareness, because within the context of um, the, within the context of the parent-child relationship, you can encourage them to attune to their, chi their child's affective states. Um, and, you know, describing is, is like, for instance, PCIT, and I know with other treatments that, to attend and describe behaviors, well, you can also describe their feelings. It looks like you're feeling happy. I, I would argue um, that, that that's a way to encourage emotion uh, identification and, and regulation. So, um, you know, this example, I really appreciate the, the question, and I think this is an example, it's a little simplistic in, in that it's just trying to illustrate the steps, but this certainly doesn't capture all, everything else that would be, um, would be going on in terms of, um, you know, encouraging the parent to help the child to use positive coping skills with their, um, with their anxiety. Any comments or follow-up or anything? Sue, I'm looking at you. If you have anything you want to say, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> and Jen, at the end, it's assuming that the, you, you, that the parent's selective attention is more powerful reinforcer than the avoidance of the feared stimulus. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that's the interesting thing where PCIT might bring to the table is like really enhancing the relationship between the parent and child so that that does become a really salient reinforcer. So yeah. just right. And um, I should say too, if at any point in this that the child is engaging in any kind of approach behavior, then you would want the parent to to focus on on that. But you're right. I mean, if we know with anxiety disorders, what, what maintains them is that avoidance is such a powerfully reinforcing, um, is, is such a powerfully re, powerful reinforcer. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think if they, um, how that would be addressed. But I think you're right in that the, the parent-child relationship and giving the parent skills would help to to overcome that and at least not inadvertently reinforce those avoidant behaviors because I think parents can without knowing give a lots of attention to the um, avoidance and not be tending to small steps toward um, approach. Did you have a question Laura or a comment? I'm just thinking that like, of course, like I'm thinking of parents rather than the clinician, if we also restrict this phrase as you were scared you did that. Absolutely, and that and that would be a great um, a great 
part of this would be to say you are, you know, you're being so brave, you know, you were scared and then you did it. And, you know, you could even have the parent point out how everything, you know, that they're okay, that they got through it. Definitely. I think that would be a great, uh, a, a great fit within this uh, framework. So one other example I wanted to, to talk about in a little bit more detail is, um, again, the use of PCIT, but with kids on the autism spectrum. There has been um, research that um, has found uh, PCIT to, and I, and I think other parenting interventions, I'm just using PCIT as, as the example. But what we know about kids who have um, you know, at least high functioning autism is that they can often come with a lot of disruptive behaviors. In fact, that may be um, the presenting problem um, over perhaps it may be unrecognized Asperger's or high functioning autism. And so the behavioral problems are really what bring a parent to a clinic. And there's some, you know, I think common themes that um, the behavioral principles of parenting are similar to um, interventions that are that are used with this population, like applied behavior analysis, there's a lot of similar kind of under undercurrents, um, and that we know that um, PCAT through the CDI skills um, promotes language, speech development, um, and again emotion awareness, which um, can be impaired in kids who on the autism spectrum, and um, this um, the. PCIT that was used for, um, in cases of autism spectrum disorder, the two phases remain the same, the CDI and the PDI, but there's a few sort of um, specific modifications for kids who have autism spectrum. And one is because there can be a rigidity and a, and a perseveration on certain topics um, that they usually we don't don't do this in PCIT where the child can lead the play and they can you know the parent is just supposed to follow but in um, these cases certain topics were prohibited due to the um, so we're not wanting to reinforce um, the child's circumscribed interests and and having them have a wider range of of interests. And then um, parents were instructed, like I said, normally um, in typical PCIT, the parents follow the lead, but in cases where these um, children got stuck on, um, they, uh, children on the spectrum tend to just want to play sort of in their own world kind of by themselves, and in order to promote a sort of a, a positive interaction, that parents were, um, when appropriate, coached to redirect the child's attention um, redirect the interaction so it wasn't just um, that the child sort of doing what they they wanted to do which is a little a little different that that does happen but usually it occurs in the second phase of um, treatment the PDI so they just bumped it up and then a lot a lot of praise when the child initiated interactions because again um, children on the spectrum tend to to not do that and, and it's important for their um, social skill development that lots and lots of praise and they also included some children older than seven to um, to allow for children who maybe have some um, developmental or cognitive um, delays and um, they they found some positive results that um, I think what not only did they find that problem behaviors um, went down into the to the non-clinical range but um, how the parents saw, and this is where, you know, again, um, where uh, we're trying to uh, affect in all these evidence-based parenting practices is um, changing their view of the child from perhaps a negative one to a more positive one. And so they saw their child as being more flexible, which again, in children on the spectrum, they can be very rigid, very inflexible, have a hard time, um, you know, changing from one situation to the next. And that there was um, more child flexibility, they were able to do that. And that the positivity between the parent and the, the child um, improved. Well, I think what's important in this is that um, parenting a child um, with autism spectrum disorder can be very stressful. And so um, they didn't see improvements. A lot of times you'll see improvements in uh, just overall parenting stress. 
and they didn't see sort of market improvements. And I think what that just highlights is that you know um, that none of the you know these treatments aren't always a panacea. That it's not like one treatment is going to um, fit all of the family's needs, and that for these parents, they mean you know additional supports for um, deal, you know um, dealing with a kid who has autism spectrum. And the other um, treatment that we um, offer here in, in Washington is a Positive Parenting Program, or referred to as Triple P. And it goes up in age range, so it um, can go up to age 16. So whereas PCIT is really um, generally limited to the younger kids, this has a, a much wider, uh, wider scope. Um, Similar, though, in terms of the target um, behavioral problems at kids who have um, disruptive behaviors, acting out, and in families in which the um, relationship needed uh, needs some improvement, some enhancement. It tends to be a pretty flexible model, um, and it really uh, wants to empower um, parents to be able to, um, you know, Identify goals for them for themselves as parents and um, to, to to work toward those. And this self-regulatory framework is, um, you know, again part of um, encouraging parents to reflect on um, what parts of their parenting um, they feel is going well and what are some things they would like to to work toward. The neat thing about Triple P too is um, that I won't go into is. It has multiple levels of focus, and so it's really meant to be uh, kind of adopts a public health model um, where, depending on the, the level, it increases in intensity of intervention and scope. But um, like a, a, a level one would be sort of a mass media um, uh, campaign to just promote general parenting practices all the way up to more, a, a more one-on-one -on -one, um, intervention. And here are some, some of the main principles upon which Triple P um, is, is based. And Triple P has also um, you know, expanded its, its reach um, in their Stepping Stones program for developmental disabilities. And like I said, a lot of these parenting practices have been looking at um, how it can be used with maltreating families or parents who are identified at high risk. Um, and so their pathways uh, model is the sort of that considered the highest um, level on that. And it also, like I said, goes up to 16. So they have a, um, a team, which is, which is great. And then recently I just found out that they're also looking more into the sort of health, um, health world and doing a, a one called lifestyles for, for overweight children. So really, Really neat to see how um, you know these interventions are are being used across a wide variety of, of populations and families. And then, incredible years um, is another uh, evidence-based parenting practice developed by um, Carolyn Webster Stratton right here um, at the University of Washington. And the unique um, feature of this that I think separates it from other parenting is the, is the format in which it's delivered and that it's a group format. And so generally I think there's like 11 to 12 um, participants in the group and the, there is a, a group leader or a coach who um, has video vignettes that are used in each of the groups that model um, both effective parenting practices and um, ineffective ones and then uses that as a way to um, encourage discussion in the group, um, skill development, opportunities to, to practice the skills in the group, to, to role play. Um, and the, it goes, there's IY Baby, which is for kids as young as, for parents as, of kids as young as one month. Um, all the way up to 12 to 12 years of age. Um, there also have been there's an advanced program which is more um, geared toward parents who may have additional um, factors that we know um, kind of place families at risk: um, substance use, depression. Um, like I said, families who are at risk of maltreatment or have been identified as maltreating. 
Um, and the, there's complementary programs um, for the children and for the teachers. So it's really meant to cut across um, all, all settings. Um, safe care is, again, the um, treatment that my, um, my colleague, uh, Kimberly Shoecraft, is um, very well trained in and will be talking about. Um, safe care is unique in that it's really targeted toward um, reducing uh, risk of neglect. Um, we know that that is the predominant referral for um, folks in child welfare is neglect. So this is really um, great that there's a intervention that's specifically targeting this. Um, and the, the sort of three main areas, again, very similar. It's, it's focused on the parent-child interaction much like all these other um, parenting programs that we've been talking about today and setting up routines, but also um, because of the, these are neglect, uh, neglectful families or at high risk that they focus on home safety and um, you know, reducing hazards in the home that could potentially endanger children and also children's health. And they have found um, a reduction in families going through safe care in terms of their return to um, child welfare. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not family preservation, um, but it is. Um, I don't I don't know. We, I, I think Kimberly will be able to touch upon um, that, but it's definitely not. Uh, I would say within the family preservation service model. It's really a um, very structured, um, it, it is delivered in the home, but just because it's delivered in the home doesn't mean it's um, uh, family preservation um, services. So it's uh, a structured behavioral parent, um, and there's a curriculum, like for example, here is an example of a worksheet that a um, home visitor might uh, use to uh, determine you know, how many hazards in each of these, these areas. So um, that's a great question. I encourage you to come to, to her talk. Was there another? I thought I saw another hand up. Um, and then just one last thing I want to kind of, you know, technology has um, hopefully and generally improved, improved our lives. Sometimes it's a, it's a double-edged sword. But I think what's really great is how these um, evidence-based um, practices are drawing upon um, new technologies, technologies that are already available to increase how many folks can get access to these interventions. And they're really being creative um, and in ways that make these interventions more accessible and reach people that may not otherwise come to the attention um, of, of a clinician. And um, what, what also they found across these different, so like PCIT, that a lot, one of the things that a lot of people say is prohibitive is that if you do the, you know, who, can, who has a one-way mirror um, where they have, you know, some agencies do, and if you are from agencies that do, that's great. But I know not a lot of them do. And so there's these different ways in which um, for just, you know, a few hundred dollars as opposed to, I think, a, a room, a PCIT room in its, you know, standard um, specifications would be thousands of dollars. Um, just having a, like a camera hooked up to a monitor so you wouldn't need a one-way mirror. You could just do it from one room to another and um, just observe the um, interaction through that way. Use walkie-talkies, um, you know, really affordable. And uh, another, another kind of exciting uh, innovation or I guess adaptation of technology is um, doing home-based doing home -based PCIT but from more like a Skype kind of model where the parent is in the home um, and the therapist is remote but they are using a, uh, you know, some sort of webcam and um, secure video conferencing where they can actually observe the parent-child interaction in the home and um, coach them and, and basically conduct, conduct a session. Um, so that's kind of new, um, exciting stuff that's coming down, down the pike. Um, the other uh, thing I, I thought was really kind of a, a great use of, of iPhones is um, Safe Care is 
had um, f families use iPhones to video uh, record the different homes, the different rooms in their homes. And that way, like that um, checklist that I showed you, that hazard checklist, that the um, home visitor is able to do that um, through the through observing, you know, the video that was sent by the family, so that they can, um, you know, make visits, but not as as many, tell um, assign like homework to work on this and send them that. What also they found, it's not just um, that these outcomes like in, in the safe care that they improved in terms of the number of hazards, but also I think technology can be used as an engagement, um, an engagement sort of strategy, if you will, in that they found that these folks were more likely to um, you know, do, what, do what we want them to do in treatment, to attend sessions, to participate, to engage, um, they're able to, you know, they were able to say, great job, you know, talk about, you know, labeled praise just doesn't work for kids, it works for grown-ups too. And to be able to stay on top of, um, have those interactions. So um, I think that's just kind of some exciting um, stuff. So um, this is just the, to say, you know, there's many, many sort of exciting pathways um, that are leading to some, some great results. And um, there are some resources that I've attached, like I said, to the end of your um, handout for those of you who are interested. And I also have, for those of you, um, I have a listing in at least Region 2 um, providers of IY Safe Care and PCIT. So I will sort of put those out here for those of you who are, are interested. But um, I appreciate your attention and your great questions and comments. And um, that's, I think, we'll, we'll end.